That's all they do. So Aquinas does try that strategy in places, but he doesn't always say that. Sorry not to, um, not to have a, a solution to the, the problem, but... Okay, Steve? This is a follow-up yeah, to Dess's question. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to turn the mic on? I did. <laughs> this is a follow-up to Dess's question. <laughs> what would he make of the view that you find among earlier um, thinkers, especially in the Arabic and Jewish tradition, that concurrence consists in a kind of refusal to prevent? So to take the case of prophecy um, in certain thinkers, and, and thinking of Maimonides, and I think Avicenna as well, that um, an individual, um, insofar as he or she perfects their natural powers through their own resources, unless God intervenes, they will prophesize. And mm. that's regarded as a kind of concurrence <clears throat> without re requiring uh, a, an additional act of intervention by God. So you could say that there was a, the default was uh, that things go along on their own steam and uh, the special case is when there's an obstruction. Um, so that's not what they say. None of them say that. Mm -hmm. they, uh, Aquinas and Scotus have a kind of heavyweight idea that, um, that somehow uh, God is the first cause and the other causes depend, created causes always depend on um, uh, God in causing, that, that their, their, their power is somehow activated by it or applied by it. Or, or, um, and, uh, and then Occam says, what does that mean, right? Um, um, but even Occam, who says no account has been given, says, well, God is an immediate partial cause of every effect. So that's to say that there's some causal contribution that God has to make in every case of interaction. So there's no inertia, there's no natural inertia um, that re uh, basically, for nature to keep going in the usual way um, is something that uh, God is always acting together with. It's not as if God only gets into the act when something happens contrary to nature or outside nature. So concurrence couldn't possibly mean simply allowing? No, Permission. not according to them. Right. But if you ask, well, what else does it mean? I'm sorry, but they do not help me. Okay, there's two questions from this side, and then I'll get back to the, to the inner circle. Thanks. <clears throat> is this on? It's on. Okay. Uh, so this is a question about foreknowledge. Uh, uh, are the, you know, Aquinas, Scotus, and Occam, are they in agreement about uh, about divine foreknowledge and future contingents and things of that sort. So, for example, God knows that Aquinas is going to write the Summa. Mm -hmm. He knows about all the problems Aquinas is going to encounter uh, ahead of time. Um, and uh, he also knows that he knows about all the, the natural regularities but also he knows exactly when he's going to perform miracles. Okay, so presumably that all has to be built in to what God has the capacity to do. So do these three thinkers agree among themselves about um, the place of foreknowledge in this scheme? No, they don't agree about, I mean, they, let's put it this way. They all agree that God has complete knowledge of everything that uh, happens in the created world, but uh, they um, do not agree about God's relation to time. So both uh, Aquinas and Scotus believe that God has neither temporal location uh, nor temporal duration. And so God timelessly knows what God knows. And um, Occam doesn't say that. Occam says, well, of course, if God existed all by God's self in the world, 
if there were nothing other than God, there would be no regular motion, and so there would be no Aristotelian time. And so in that case, um, God would be atemporal. Um, but because to be temporal, to have temporal location or duration, is just to coexist with revolutions of the sun or whatever regular, mo regularly moving body, the cosmic clock you pick, right? And so Occam is quite happy to talk about God having temporal location and uh, duration in so far as um, a world with a, a regular motion in fact exists. So they don't agree about uh, God's relation to time and they also don't agree about how to give an account of God's um, knowledge of all the details of cosmic history. They have different accounts of that. They disagree with each other about that. Um, so roughly speaking, uh, Aquinas believes that, um, so he doesn't believe that God sees them because he causes them. It's not as if, um, and God, God does eternally will a whole package that is the cosmic plan, but he, when it comes to account for God's knowledge of the actual details of the world, he says he sees them in their own determinate actuality. And so he seems to be making a certain kind of metaphysical commitment in that passage um, about the ontological status of temporalia and as if to say that they are all eternally given, but of course uh, the, their temporal locations is just a matter of a kind of ordering relation among items that are eternally given. And God sees them in their own determinate actuality and that's how God knows them. Um, and Scotus and Occam say, but they aren't eternally given. They aren't all eternally given. Um, so they disagree about the ontological status of future contingents and therefore disagree about their account, of the metaphysical account of how God comes to know. Um, so, um, yes. All right, thanks. Um, so, so somebody like Aquinas thought that uh, you know God is simple, eternal, and unchanging. They all thought that. Yeah, right. So, uh, so it seems like those attributes would be enough to motivate God willing these like uh, simple, eternal, and unchanging exceptionalist laws. And so, I was wondering, like, it seems like part of your answer of like why they didn't uh, go ahead and uh, make that posit is that. There's some sort of limit in uh, uh, he can only do so much with the with the natures that exist, but um, it's uh, at least according to Aquinas, God could have created different uh, created different nature. natures and different uh, infinitely many other natures right and different relations between them. So it seems like God could have created a world where there were these like uh, uh, universal laws and that and that they would have theoretical motivation to, to posit those. I mean, can you say like why they didn't or something? Okay, so there are several different, you put several different issues here, right? Um, one is whether a simple God would want a simple world order, okay? Another is whether they conceive of relations among um, natural, uh, created, created causes in terms of laws. Now, one of the thrusts of my paper is well, and this, it, you can say it's a historical point more than anything else, I suppose, but my point is that when they think about natural explanation, um, they, uh, and think of uh, uh, creatures uh, causally interacting, they do not reach for the conceptuality of law. That doesn't mean that they don't believe in regularities, they just don't call the regularities laws. Um, that, you know, it's always or for the most part, right, so the Aristotelian scientific program is, always or for the most part regularities, demands a theoretical entity to explain it. Uh, what is that gonna be? It's gonna be a formal functional principle. Where is it gonna be? It's gonna be in the functioning thing. So that's the, that's the little model that they're using. And they don't say, oh, those regularities make a natural law. That's not what they say. So it's a point about what conceptual frame were they reaching for when they um, reached, okay. Now, it would be perfectly compatible with that to say um, that, um, in fact, uh, things always, always happen according to, um, to nature, you know. It might be, God could, of course, have willed that from, in every state, no matter what state, right, um, God, that, uh, that God is going to not obstruct or um, support, uh, concur, whatever, um, uh, with the natural causes so they get to do their thing and uh, things turn out just 
always turn out just the way Aristotelian science would have taught us, right? It's just that it has more ontological props than Aristotle thought, but that's okay. So you could say, so you might have, that would be a metaphysical possibility according to these, each and all of these people, but it's not the actuality according to them. And the reason they don't believe it's the actuality um, is that they are philosophical theologians and they think there is data that Aristotle did not have, uh, include, which include uh, the occurrence of things that will be contrary to what, uh, contra incompatible with the idea that things are getting to do their natural thing all the time. Um, and so, um, uh, so there are lots of these. There are things that happen in this world, uh, but there are things that happen in Eden, and there are different things that will happen in the world to come, which is really wild and woolly. And, uh, um, and so, and then you say, and so why do they say that? Why don't they, why do they say that? Because they want to say, God is not simply interested in the natural world. They take over, and indeed they re consistently attribute it to Aristotle, which I think is very interesting. They take over the idea that everything else in the created world exists for the sake of humankind. And then they have a narrative about what uh, God's relation to the human race is. And uh, they think that um, whether God goes along with the natural um, powers of creatures is governed by God, the narrative that God wants to actualize between God and the human race. And it's not primarily about whether fire heats water. It's primarily about whether, um, whether people get to uh, get together in the heavenly city and and love God and neighbor. That's what's, that's the big project, right? And whether there's gonna be enough people to populate heaven and how are we gonna get those and all that kind of thing. So that's the narrative into which all of this gets embedded. And of course, there are various miraculous events in the Bible that are part of the narrative and so on. So God is, God might have an inclination, he might have a taste for simplicity, but it might be trumped by things. And Occam is really big on this. He said, well, you know, um, don't think that you can be so sure uh, what, what God will be interested in, right? I mean, I mean uh, you go along, you think that uh, God, I mean, Aquinas will say, well, God wouldn't make, God wouldn't, it wouldn't be the case in every state, that God would make sheep and make most of the sheep blind and three-legged. God wouldn't make things of kind K without letting at least some of things of kind K do the K thing, right? That would be inconsistent of purpose. And Occam says, come on, uh, why do you suppose that just because God is simple, that the intentional object of God's choice has to be simple? And God, who knows what God's purpose is? And of course, Revelation may tell us something about what God's purpose is, but if you try to go beyond that, then, um, you know, you're, you're on, um, unsubstantial ground, yeah. Okay, uh, there's um, five more people in the queue, so, uh, and not that much time. So, uh, Carl, and then- And I cut. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I uh, did. Uh, Robert and Martha, a person on my right, and then Dan or Nancy, one of the two. Okay, so the first person is Carl. Okay, go ahead. Okay, okay, up is on, yeah, okay. Uh, this is a follow-on to Steve's follow-on to Des's uh, uh, question. Uh, I've observed in a couple of places in Malbranche something that uh, hasn't <coughs> got into my talk for this afternoon, but it's something he says uh, that clearly is relevant to one of his lines of argument uh, for occasionalism. He expresses the view that it's incompatible with the perfection of God's being for God to do anything negative in uh, purely negative, by which pretty clearly is meant for God to do any act whose uh, intentional object is mere non-being. And the consequence that he's drawing from that is that the only <laughs> way that God can annihilate a creature is by not conserving it. But it occurs to me to wonder whether a similar line of argument would lead to the conclusion that the only way that God could obstruct a created power would be 
by either not concurring with it or not creating it in the first place. Uh, or, uh, and uh, I'm wondering, is there any precedent for views of that family in the medieval 